Nearly a day after rescuing the Nizumi, Balvan emerged into the Garden of Three Skies. He was covered in cuts and scrapes, all around his armor, even some on his head. But as the trio he had saved, and many others gathered around, looking to thank, or to aid, or to comfort him, he said only, Please tell Alice and Zonda I am here. I will return to them very soon. And any further questions fell away, as they saw the huge mound of silver coins he was pulling up through the ground on a sort of stone sledge. Several people ran off to the tunnels to do as he said, as he hauled the massive load, sliding it up the slopes to the church of Pelor. If his wounds were serious, the spirit showed no sign of being slowed by them. And so Balvan stood beneath the statue of Pelor, the corners of the church piled high with useless coins, when a voice spoke from behind him. They must really have pissed you off this time. Balvan turned toward the entrance, where Swain, the West King, leaned against the heavy stone door frame. If he had hoped to surprise the spirit, he got no such reaction. I was hoping to see you, said Balvan. Really? Swain raised an eyebrow, then looked lost in thought for a moment. I don't think anyone has ever been glad to see me. There was a strange earnestness to what could easily have been a mocking or perhaps an intimidating remark, but Balvan was direct as always. They say you were powerful, that you have many powers. My daughter is dying. Do you think you could save her? Do you know who you are asking this? What kind of person I am? Swain sounded perplexed. Yes, said Balvan, who had sought out all the stories after their last meeting. I do. Curious, the vampire listened as he explained how Alice had been born, and what other spirits had said, Mother Fox, Awan, the Efreet. Finally, Swain said, My kind are not known for healing. Not for healing others, anyway. I know only one way to save the dying, and it comes at great cost. And frankly, I don't think it would work on a spirit. Please, could you try? I would pay whatever cost. Both knew that cost had nothing to do with the great golden statue or the piles of silver surrounding them. Don't get me wrong, you would owe me, stated the vampire turning and pacing up the wall as he spoke. But I don't think you understand. I don't know if you can understand what it would cost for your daughter. Alice. Right. What would it cost her? We're talking about transforming her, as I was transformed. We're talking about turning her into a vampire. Reaching the top of the wall section, the young-looking man changed his angle began striding across the beams of the church's stone rafters, upside down. Balvan paused. She would have to hurt people to survive. She could learn. I could teach her. And like all creatures, vampires have the instinct to survive. In his mind, Balvan remembered lifting his girl over his head, grinning with her arms straight out. He remembered the feeling of trying and trying to stand her on her feet, only to give up and set her down on her behind. She is a child. Children are adaptable. They learn quickly, Swain said, darkly, but grew even more serious, gazing down at the statue of Pelor from above. That's only part of it. Spirits like you have two lives, right? Here and the other place. The astral? They say mortals have two lives as well, though it's different. That's why those drow carry around coins for the ferrymen. When they die, it is said their soul goes off to another place, past your astral sea, or hidden in it, something like that. A lot of wise people have told me this, and I know damn near all mortals believe it. Yes? Balvan had heard similar things, but he did not understand Swain's point. The West King floated down from the rafters to face him, though he remained upside down with his hands in his jacket pockets. Vampires don't have that. They say we're already dead. Whatever a soul is, mine is busy keeping me here. 
With the blood of other creatures, we can live forever in the mortal realm, if we are careful, if we play our cards right. But if we die as a vampire, that's it. Nothing after. That's what I'm told. But Alice is not immortal. The spirits do not die, even if our body does. That is what I've been told. That's why I don't think I can turn her. Why I don't think it would work, Swain said, rotating in midair until he hovered upright, just above the ground. And even if it did, would she even be a spirit anymore? Would she still have your astral life? I doubt it. What... what would it take to try? First, if we were to do this, make this pact, know that it will cost me something even to try. It'll take a small amount of my true blood. So if she fails to turn, you would still owe me a favor. And if it works, if you do save her, then... Swain paused, sounding less certain than usual. Then it would cost me much more. I suppose I'd have to take her away for a time, teach her to live as a vampire. I suppose for that, you'd have to belong to me. I cannot do that. I belong to another. <sighs> the vampire sighed. Well then, how about I and anyone I choose would have free passage over and through the mountain, and you would guard it and anything I put there against anyone else. Bavon stood for a very long moment, weighed down by his decision. I will consider it. Doesn't matter to me. I'd just as soon not go to the trouble. But I will make that bargain if you want. Another thing to remember, though. He looked over at the gleaming statue. Once you become a vampire, you can never again see the sun. And he soared out and down the mountain, disappearing into shadow. Balvon returned to the Garden of the Feywild and hugged Alice and Zonda. Seeing them again made him so happy, yet hurt more than all the drow knives and crossbows, for he too had returned without an answer. He played with the child in the garden. They made little stone castles and little stone people who Alice moved around. Then Balvon raised her up on his shoulders and carried her all around the mountain until she needed to rest. Then he and Zonda went up to the peak, and he told her all he had found. She was unsurprisingly concerned by the dangers he had faced, and he was not proud in describing how he sought out and fought the Dark Elves even glossing over the details of how he battled them without the strength of the mountain, even though he had obviously made it back all right. Still, it worried her, her windy fingers feeling and probing his injuries. She tried to console him for having become so angry. It made her uncomfortable, but he had been trying to make it safer for the people here, and even then he clearly felt guilty. But of course, the discussion turned to Swain. And... Even if it were, she would not be able to face the full sun. She would probably have to remain in my world, where the light is always dim. As Balvan repeated Swain's warnings aloud, his face and voice sank, as though each facet of the transformation was another weight laid upon his chest. But this last part he croaked out, for he knew that of the three worlds, the shadowy one from whence Balvan came was not a place Zonda belonged. It sounds like too much. If she could lose it, if she might stop being a spirit, and to never see the sun again. No, no. Maybe, maybe someone can help us find the missing djinn. Maybe, said Balvan. Zonda, Balvan, and all the spirits they knew went out to seek anyone who could lead them to the lost djinn of earth and wind, for surely a powerful spirit of the same dual nature as Alice could find a way to save her. Orange Ears asked Mother Fox, who benefited from the whispers of her many mischievous children. Villaveth asked the great cloud whale Awan, who knew many spirits of the air and of the void, the infinite sky, 
Shoti Rui sought the aid of other predators and spirits of nature, and Vohoin shared what little they knew of the true jinns, but what the Afrit had said held true. No one seemed to know where the missing jinn could be, and as time passed, Alice grew more tired. She could only take short trips around the mountain, even on her father's shoulders, and now spent most of the time lying down. She had many friends who would come to visit her, like Mala, who, though she had only feathers, learned how to do braids from other children so that she could sit and braid Alice's hair. And Zonda, in her morning journeys up the mountain, would stir up many birds, such that as she soared down a slope, caressing the ring Balvan had given her, a great and motley flock would fly over the stone child, giving her a show. Alice would try to count them, raising her arms instinctively, as she used to reach out for things when she was younger. But Alice grew weaker still, and soon she did not raise her arms, even for the birds. Alice's time was clearly drawing shorter, in hopes of finding the gin fading, leading Balvan's thoughts back more and more to Swain's option. He and Zonda had never before argued, not really, not seriously, for almost every time they disagreed, one of them could see that the matter was more important to the other, and so they had given ground. But in such little time, Alice had become so important to both of them that it was harder to give ground, for it was not their ground to give, it was the child's future. Neither of them wanted to condemn their loving child to a life of hunting for blood, of killing. Other spirits, like Shoti Rui, the dragonfly, were not so sure this was different than other predators who must kill and eat to live. But the mortal people of the mountain were adamant that a vampire was a different and monstrous thing. Zonda did not want to risk Alice's astral life, for there she would continue forever, even after her body faded. Balvon did not want to risk Alice's life here, in the worlds of mortals, for neither he nor the child could see the astral, and he worried that they might not have the same life there which other spirits did after losing their bodies, and Balvon worried that he may be left behind. But though he could not see the astral sea, Balvon trusted the other spirits, and after long and painful debate with Zonda, never angry, but very sad, the mountain agreed that it was best to let Alice pass on, where Zonda could watch over her in the astral. Time passed, as it always did, but Alice's time seemed to be coming to an end. Zonda and Balvan tried to shield her from the sorrow that they felt, spending as much time with her as they could, trying to show her that she was loved. But little Alice, who could do little but lie amidst the garden, began asking questions, and it was hard. When she asked why she was always tired when others were not, they told her she was sick. When she asked why she was sick, Zonda fought not to cry. Balvan said that he had wished to have a child, but it had been very difficult for him to give her life, and had barely succeeded. When she asked what would happen to her, Zonda explained again about the astral sea, where Alice glowed brightly, and that when she fell asleep for the last time, she would finally see it, and Zonda would bring by all her friends from the sky. But when she asked if Daddy would be there too, Zonda explained that, like Alice, he was there in the astral, but could not see or hear them. She assured the child that one day he would join them. Balvan did not cry, for he was stone. Passing by the cemetery in the middle world, where the people of the mountain buried their dead, Balvan paused again, as he had many times in recent weeks, before the grave of that Nizumi who had died before he got back, on the Day of Silver. The mortals marked the graves with flat stones, sometimes level with the ground, sometimes planted to stand upright, engraved with the name of the deceased, 
usually with a short message from those who cared for them. In memory of our beloved Kashoka, she was taken from us far too soon. On this day, after seeing the grave so many times, Balvan was suddenly inspired to make something for his daughter. He pulled out his great stone shield, a slab far larger than any of the other gravestones, and with his power he shaped the stone, etching words into its near impenetrable rock. But when he carved his daughter's name into the stone in large letters, Alice, he stopped, and his heart fell. Though she was not yet gone, seeing her fate etched upon the stone was so painful to him that he had to put the shield down and turn away. There came a day when, as Balvan lay beside his sleepy child, a small white fox made their way up the slope in cute little leaps and bounds. Hello, said Balvan. Do you not recognize me? asked the fox in a small voice, then spun around as though chasing their tail, and in a great swelling ball of fur they expanded into the huge orange form of Mother Fox, who unfurled her many tails. Ah, oh. gasped Alice happily, but though her eyes widened a little at the sight, she barely moved otherwise. The great fox leaned down and nuzzled the stone child with her massive snout, curling herself around the pair, though Balvan, not as comfortable with being touched, glided down into the stone, emerging on his feet a few steps away. Hello, little mountain, she said, surrounding Alice in fluffy warmth, but her voice in Balvan's mind was gentle and sad. These are her last days. Balvan just looked at them, at Alice's small face poking out from the middle of the orange spirit. If you do what you are thinking of, continued the fox, nobody knows what will happen. If she passes as she is now, at least you know you will one day be reunited in the astral. I don't know that, said Balvan, for that was his true fear. Neither he nor Alice could see the spirit world. What if they could not join it as other spirits do? What if he might never see her again? Balvan glided back through the stone, rising up slowly beneath his daughter, her long heavy hair falling around his arms as he gently cradled her. She had fallen asleep in the warm embrace of Mother Fox, who now uncurled from around them. You will break both of their hearts she said aloud, as the mountain spirit held his frail daughter in his great strong arms, his decision hardening. Then three hearts will be broken, said Balvan heavily. After a few steps, though, he paused again. Will they ever forgive me? That I do not know, said Mother Fox, dwindling back down to an ordinary snow fox, bounding away down the slope, but Balvan heard in his mind, Good luck. Carrying the sleeping child through the tunnel back to his shadowy, shallow world, he called upon Shotirui and asked the hunter, Please find the West King and tell him I am ready. Tell him I will pay the cost. The dragonfly spirit flew off in the direction of Old House, and just outside the church, Balvan lay his daughter down upon the ground gently, shaping it like a pillow for her. She roused, saying sleepily, intently, Daddy. I'm going to try to help you, Alice, he said, laying his hand upon her forehead. But I don't know what will happen. It might hurt. It wasn't clear if the child understood, though, as she drifted back into sleep. Hours later, the pair had not moved a shade, like sad statues on the mountainside. The midnight sky had turned darker in advance of this world's faded dawn, when a shadow glided up to the slope. Swain's gangly form floated down to land, unnaturally as always. But in his arms, he too bore a child, clad in white robes, 
She was a human girl of no more than a dozen years, unconscious. Who is that? No one, answered Swain, and then stated abruptly, I don't want you to hate me after this is over. He paused, rethinking. Well, you probably already hate me, but I don't want you to think that I've tried to deceive you in any way about what we are doing here. This human is unconscious, he continued. If we succeed, if Alice becomes a vampire, then this one will never wake. Your daughter will need to feed. The vampire watched Balvan's face, which scarcely moved, but Swain's red eyes watched the subtle signs nonetheless. This will be only the first of many. I know you don't like to kill, but you need to realize that by making this choice, you are cursing your daughter to kill, day after day, to kill, to end far more lives than all those your mercy has ever spared, more than all those who your protection has saved. She will become a monster. No, Balvan replied with great heaviness. Swain did not react, waiting for the next words, but the spirit looked down at his daughter. It is my choice. I am the one who will be the monster. Very well. This is the pact. I will do everything in my power to save your daughter this night, to turn her into my kind. You will owe me a favor, or, if I succeed, I will become ruler of this mountain, as I rule all these lands, and you shall defend the mountain against any who pass here, save those who I allow. Anyone except Alice and Zonda, for as long as Alice lives. Whatever. Sure. Balvan paused a moment, looking up at the nothingness which loomed a dozen feet up. If it works, he asked, will she, will she be able to fly, as you do? If it works, the vampire nodded. Balvan's eyes dropped, meeting the king's. Then I agree. All right. Swain set down his unconscious charge a few feet from the stone child and bent over Alice. He looked over her for a long moment, her gently closed eyelids, her long carven hair which looked like it should flow, but lay heavily upon the ground. She looked younger than the girl he had brought, yet her life till now had been even shorter still, less than three years. Swain slipped an arm gently beneath her head, his other hand under her back, and lifted the unusually heavy child as one would lift a baby. Like Balvan, he seemed not to notice her weight. She really is on death's door. In her current state, if the curse does not take hold, her body will die from the attempt. Though, I suppose she would still die as a spirit. Her body will die if we do nothing, said the father, gravely. True. Swain looked closely at her neck, wrinkling his brow. I can't see her veins. He looked toward the human child. When I look at her, I can see every vein, every artery. I can see the blood moving through her. But your child... Alice. Alice, Swain corrected, this time actually sounding earnest about remembering her name going forward. I can see nothing through her skin, save the outline of her very heart. Balvan watched the vampire pull back his lips in a grimace, revealing wolf-like fangs, or perhaps it was that the long teeth grew before his eyes. A pair of black forms emerged point-first from Swain's back, tearing through his loose jacket, though the leather seemed to reform around them. The bat-like wings stuck out points-first, stretching and unfolding until each was wider than he was tall. Then he curled his wings, folding them around himself and the stone child in his arms, like a black curtain as a red glow overtook his eyes, whites and all. The mountain spirit could see no more through that curtain, yet he could still distantly feel the shape of his daughter, for she was of his stone, which he could sense. And he felt the holes dug into her as Swang sunk his fangs into her neck, and he heard her cry out, Ah! To another, it would not have seemed such a loud or anguished shout, 
but it was by far the loudest sound she had made in many months. He could feel her eyes snap wide open in panic. Balvan froze, with arm helplessly outstretched. There's nothing, said Swain, in a mix of irritation and other emotions harder to discern, his words slightly blurred by his fangs. No blood at all. She's solid. There was a faint, sickly sound as the vampire sucked back from the wound some substance, some very thick, dark fluid he had attempted to inject there. Balvan could feel Alice's feeble attempt to squirm, could imagine her discomfort, her fear. Yet he froze, terrified by all that was happening, by all he had done, by the darkening future he saw, and he could hear Swain breathing heavily. The West King exhaled and inhaled loudly, raggedly, and Balvan saw one of his long-fingered hands reach straight up over the top of the concealing wings, and with a metallic ring, Swain's nails stretched out like thin daggers, and he struck down. Alice cried out again, and her father felt the shape of his daughter change as the vampire's claws sliced open her chest like a sword stroke. Balvan lunged forward instinctively, grabbing the top of a wing to pull it aside, but he was shocked to find the bat-like wing was rigid like steel, and not having used his full strength, his grasp did not budge it at all. Still holding up the child with one hand, Swain raised her limp body up and bit down into the open wound, into her little chest, into the heart of stone which Balvan had shaped within her before she was born. That divided heart, infused with life by both earth and wind, into that less dense part of Alice, Swain's fangs injected a portion of the black blood, the true blood which a vampire accumulates over decades and centuries, distilled from the lifeblood of thousands. Balvan's footing was so stable that he did not stumble as Swain reopened his wings, revealing and carefully setting down Alice's limp body. It is done, Swain pronounced, his fangs already gone. Balvan dropped to his knees, leaning over Alice, placing a hesitant hand on the inch-deep slash between her sternum and belly. Her body was still and already cooling as the vampire turned away. The mountain spirit was numb. It didn't work. Swain stooped down and picked up the other girl, his dark wings slowly withdrawing towards his shoulder blades. I have given her some of my true blood, right into what passes for her heart. There was no malice in his voice, nor was there much concern, as the spirit was paralyzed by grief, withdrawing his claws, save one index finger of that hand, the vampire cut lightly along the neck of the unconscious human girl, tracing a single line of blood. She did not stir in the least, clearly in some enchanted slumber. The rest? Swain turned back to Balvan, carrying the victim with just one hand clamped tightly on her right shoulder. Striding back to the stone child, he held the human girl above her as blood from the non-arterial wound ran down her neck, down her left arm, and dripped from her fingers onto Alice's chest. The rest is up to her. Balvan leaned back, and the vampire king let a few crimson drops drip into the open wound, onto the heart, where it mingled with his tar-like black blood. Then he waved the limp body over the child's head such that a few more drops dripped from the girl's fingertips onto Alice's lips. Then he pulled her back, took one step away, and stopped as though waiting for something. Now we'll see if the curse really works on... Swain was interrupted by a twitch from the stone child's body. Balvan still had a hand on her chest, and she was still cold, but she twitched again, and her lips moved, the blood running down them into her mouth. The vampire shook the victim such that the bloody arm flopped up and down, spreading a little blood spatter in Alice's general direction. She's... Too weak, said Balvan, in a bewildering tumult of feelings. If her heart has taken my gift, she'll find the strength. Friend, Balvan turned to the dragonfly spirit, who was watching from a safe distance. Please find Zonda and tell her what I've done. Whatever happens, whatever she thinks of me now, she deserves to know what I've... She deserves a chance to... Please. 
Shoti Rui nodded and flew back down toward the Garden of Three Skies, as Swain stood holding the unconscious human like she was nothing, and as Balvon watched his daughter convulse. Alice's eyes flashed open, her pupils turning red, but she did not appear to recognize her father or anything around her. She convulsed again, then flopped over onto her side, facing away from him and toward the dripping blood. It was the most she had moved in a long time, and Balvon found himself wishing and hoping for her to move further, then realized how truly sickening it was. He was watching and cheering for his innocent, loving daughter to crawl over and drain the blood from a person they didn't even know, who'd done nothing to harm them. Balvon had killed before, had killed more than a few drow and monsters, but only in defense of himself or others, and usually only after trying to stop them without lethal force. But just as Swain had warned, his choice, his desire to save his daughter's mortal life, meant she would only survive if she could harm or kill this innocent. She stretched her arm along the ground toward the dripping blood, and inched her head over to lick blood off the ground. And those pitiful little drops seemed to give her energy. She pulled herself toward the dangling, dripping arm, lapping up the little bits of vital fluid along the way, getting close to the pale, bloody fingers, and Swain tossed the human girl another few feet away, like an unwanted sack. Alice moved her other arm, lunging with it, and began crawling properly the rest of the distance, where she licked the trail of blood up to the fingers, up the arm, tearing off the stained white sleeve like it was made of tissue paper, licking the red trail all the way up to the razor-thin cut on the victim's neck. And it was like this, the stone child suckling on the bleeding neck of a prone and passive stranger, Balvon on his knees, watching in fascination and relief and gut-wrenching horror, Swain standing over them with a look of mild interest. It was like this that Zonda found them. What did you do? She hovered, keeping Balvon between her and the utterly, irrationally terrifying presence of the youthful vampire king. But what horrified her, even beyond their beloved child's beast-like demeanor, was the astral scene. There knelt her friend, his aura grim, his daughter's glow so small and dim. The West King stood, a dark abyss, and before them both more darkness. On the ground, where girls should be, a small black void that was Alice. Her body has moved away from her, Zonda moaned. Balvon turned from the violent spectacle to the wind spirit, his eyes full of sorrow and guilt. She floated there, near the ceiling of this dark and shallow world, watching the child move one place, while in the astral sea the same child was still, small, weak, like a spirit whose body had been lost. But the body, she's hollow. Her memories will all still be there, but she can't think right now. She must feed, because she has never fed before. Swain slipped his hands into his pockets, the wing holes in his jacket already healed. Growing stronger as she fed, Alice's suckling grew rougher, more violent. She started biting at the neck around the wound, a sight made so much more sickening by the limp, unreactive, still-breathing victim. A girl the same apparent age as the body Balvon had sculpted. The stone child snarled, having seemingly forgotten the long gash running down her own chest, and the biting grew increasingly fierce. Here it comes, said Swain, with just a hint of amusement. Alice pulled at the skin of the neck with her round, little, human-like teeth, most of the marks not even breaking the surface. But then she reared up, arcing her back, and made a sound that was both angry, terrified, and also the whimper of a child who heard. 
Balvan turned away from his friend, turned back to the results of his choice. He could not avert his eyes. Alice opened her mouth and cried and howled and teethed. Her incisors erupted out, growing into long wolf fangs, which she immediately buried into flesh, biting and ripping. Arterial blood sprayed into the air, all over the white robes, all over Alice. Throat torn out, the victim bled. She died, and the vampire Alice lived. The choice made by the mountain was set in stone, and his pact sealed with blood. Bavon turned to Zonda, rising to his feet. Regret and relief, a thousand words he wanted to say and apologize, explain and grieve, but nothing came out. Instead, she spoke first. I'm sorry, she whispered. Only those words, and she soared away. She gusted back through to the Garden of Three Skies, through the tunnel to the other worlds, leaving Balvon with arm outstretched. Why, he said to the one who had left, it was me. He turned back to his daughter, a girl soaked and satiated by the life of another. The beast satisfied, she began to cry. For the first time Alice cried, a pitiful little girl's tears, but tears of blood. Balvan strode over to her, fell down before her, wrapped his arms around her. Like a tantrum, she struggled against him, scratched him with her new claws, stronger than he had ever felt her, but she could not break free of his grasp. She struggled and struggled and then gave up, burying her face into him, clutching him to her, covering him in gore and bloody tears. Daddy! I love you, Alice. I'm so sorry. She's going to need my help, said Swain, who hadn't moved. You, Alice, you're a vampire now. You're no longer condemned to fade away, but only as long as you continue to feed. The girl's eyes peered out from her father's powerful grasp, red pupils amid big eyes dripping red, in a face smeared with more drying red. If you go too long without blood, hunger will overcome you. You need to learn how to hunt, to kill. Things your father can't teach you. The vampire extended his open hand down to her, but those confused, blood-red eyes looked back up at her father. I'm sorry, but I think he's right, Alice. Please go with him. You're finally strong again. He can teach you to survive. Bavon hugged her tighter. You can return as soon as you're ready. The mountain will always be here, waiting for you. He released her, motioning towards Swain's outstretched hand. Alice stood, for the first time in a year, hugging her father once more, red tears still flowing. Then she slowly, fearfully turned to the handsome man extending his hand. As Alice reached up, she missed his hand. She tried again as he drifted slowly up and away, and Balvan frowned. Alice jumped, stretching her arm upward, but fell just short. Frustrated, she tried again, straining, and he pulled away again. Then he started to grin. The bloody child had missed his hand, but Balvan's eyes widened, for she did not come down. You flew. I can fly. She said, slowly turning in the air, a little girl smiling at her father, despite all that had happened. In the joy of discovery, she spread her arms straight out to either side like wings, floating up slowly, drifting over to either side, and her long hair drifted out behind her, for the first time resembling the wind that had inspired it. I knew you could, said Swain, and she turned back to him in wonder. She looked at this stranger, unaware how intimately connected they already were, but she looked down his arm to his proffered hand, and she grasped it with her own small fingers. Let me show you my home. Alice looked back to Balvan for permission, and he nodded, sadly. But as she turned to go, he rushed forward and grabbed her where she hovered, 
turning her and hugging her face to face, forehead to forehead. She was still cold in his arms, only slightly warmer after feeding. But she grinned and hugged him back. When at last they released one another, his face was almost as bloody as hers. I will make sure she's all right, said the West King. You can just clear off my mountain. And with that, he smiled down at Alice, took her hand once more, then looked ahead, and they soared off down the mountain into the darkness. Balvon did not cry, for he was stone. Balvon lingered after they left his sight. Then with a jolt like a blade to his heart, his thoughts turned to Zonda, and he rushed through the Garden of Three Skies, the blood covering his face and chest, all left behind as he phased through the stone. He searched and asked around the mountain in the middle world, but she wasn't there. He searched and asked around the mountain in the sky world, but she wasn't there. Baldon looked up at the great endless sky. He knew that, unlike the middle world, here everything he could see was only the beginning. Perhaps Zonda had flown high away in anger or grief or in mis placed guilt, even though everything from Alice's birth to what had just happened, Balvan knew that every part of their sorrow had been his fault. But Vohoen saw Balvan and came to him. She is gone, said the fire spirit. Where? asked Balvan, though suddenly he feared that he knew the answer. Gone to the astral sea. She said Alice is still there. And she was on her own. She said to tell you she is sorry. I... Balvan had nothing to say. He wanted to tell Zonda that she had nothing to apologize for. But he had told her before, and she could not believe. He wanted to tell her that he was selfish and a coward, that, that he couldn't let go even though he may have driven both her and Alice away. He wanted to tell her that the mountain will always be here for her, but she knew that as well. So instead, he asked Vohoen, Tell her that she flew. Alice flew. The sorrows did not end there, for Balvan had agreed to secure the mountain for Swain. The people of the mountain stood in disbelief as he told them that they must choose a world to stay in, and told those in his own plane that they must either choose another world or leave the safety of his mountain. None may stay here, save by order of the West King. I have given my word. Balvan was not known for jokes, but he was known to protect everyone as long as they did not harm each other. It was such a shock that nobody moved. And so the spirit of the mountain walked up the slope. Before their eyes, Balvan concentrated on the great stone cathedral, the church he had built to Palor, and it began to sink into the mountain. He took care not to break its great walls, for it was still a monument to his first friend. He took care to move it as one piece, instead shifting the stone beneath it out of the way. And as the roof passed below the surrounding slopes, he shaped the rock over top to cover it, until even the steeple towers at the front sank below the surface. Go now. Tell everyone to choose a world where they will stay, for I will be sealing the garden in twenty-four hours. The exodus was a hardship for the people of the mountain. Many had attachments to one world, but friends or family with connections to another. Balvan was forcing a terrible, permanent choice upon them. Up till the end, some didn't believe that the strong but gentle guardian spirit they had known would abandon them and force them from their homes. But when the time came, he trekked through to the sky world. Any who wish to leave this world must do so now, he said. But none moved. All those who wished to go had already gone. Balvan looked at the spot on the garden where Alice had lain for months, and next to it, the stone ring he had given to Zonda. That ring, the symbol that she would always return to the mountain, was it still true? 
Balvan sunk the Fey Garden below the surface of the mountain, cutting this world off from the others, though he could still pass through the stone. He did the same for the Garden of the Middle World, blocking it off and leaving the people there on their own. By the time he returned to the Shadowfell, he was alone. For those few who chose to remain in that dark world, mostly Kenku and Mizumi, knew this place would not be safe without his protection. They had already left to find more of their peoples. He sunk the fell garden into the mountain with the others. The three gardens still linked across the worlds, but all inaccessible from the surface, all empty and alone, the plants and flowers doomed to fail in the darkness. Balvan checked on the ring, made sure the space around it was clear and secure, sealed off from the rest of the now dark gardens. Then he went to stand upon the mountain that was him, to await the return of those he cared for most. Thank you for listening to me rambling my way through the saga of Balvan, this whole giant thing which I made just to fill in a little backstory of a pretty minor character from Tales from My D&D Campaign. This saga told the tale of what was most important to Balvan, and mainly from his point of view. But I'm sure you noticed some big holes, some things skipped over. <coughs> Drought Empress. <laughs> Eventually, I hope to fill some of those in a couple of videos, which may be renamed later, tentatively called Basics the Drow and Basics Vampires. For now, though, I need to get back to writing my military fantasy novel, Mage Captain Sahra, for my lore master patrons. If you want to get those chapters as they are slowly written, or just want to support tales from my D&D campaign and other storytelling videos like this one, you can do so at patreon.com slash demonac. It's people like you who make it possible for this to be my job, and I can't thank my patrons enough, especially the far too generous members of the organization. Thank you for giving me a chance to write and tell more stories. Uh.